We'll hear argument first this morning in case 08661, American Needle versus the National Football League. Mr. Nager. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. Uh, in this case, the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit held that an agreement of the 32 teams of the National Football League was immune from any scrutiny under Section 1 of the Sherman Act on the ground that the agreement allegedly fails the plurality of actor requirement of this Court's jurisprudence. The 32 teams of the National Football League are separately owned and controlled profit-making enterprises. Under this Court's decision in NCAA, as well as the Court's more general joint venture jurisprudence, those clubs are entities whose distinct agreements are indeed subject to Section 1 scrutiny. The fact of the matter is there is a long-standing consensus, judicial and legislative, that agreements among sports teams about whether and how they will participate in the marketplace is subject to scrutiny under the Sherman Act, Section 1. The Court's decision in NCAA is most directly on point. In that case, the Court held that a policy of the NCAA that restricted the ability of member institutions of the NCAA to sell TV rights violated Section 1. Just as with the NFL, the decisions of the NCAA were ultimately controlled by the vote of its members, and for that reason, the Court held that the NCAA policy was a horizontal restraint. But there was no joint venture with respect to the television rights, meaning there was no separate activity other than the tele televising of the shows at issue. Here, the Solicitor General is saying there is a joint venture, and it has to do with the licensing of trademarks, with their quality control, et cetera. Isn't that a substantial difference? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so, because what we're, we're, what we're asking about here is, is the question of whether or not the agreement of the teams involves a plurality of actors. And just as in NCAA, that's the members' uh, institutions, because they control the operation of the NCAA and the policy that it was promulgating, there was a plurality of actors. So, too, here, the 32 teams of the National Football League uh, have entered into an agreement and control uh, the use collectively of the trademarks and logos of the individual teams. And for that reason, there is concerted activity that's involved. Justice Sotomayor, the point that you raise uh, might be of a, a, a point of difference that the NFL could argue in the context of an ancillary restraint analysis, in the context of a rule of reason analysis, but it's not a point of distinction that they can argue properly in the context of the concerted conduct inquiry. The, the NCAA case simply applies the consistent teachings of this Court in cases like Seeley, BMI, and Copperweld that separately owned and controlled entities entering into agreements, those agreements co constitute concerted conduct subject to scrutiny under the antitrust laws. Does that cover everything that the NFLA does? Because everything is subject to agreement. It's all concerted action. So is everything under the Sherman Act, and then it goes to rule of reason analysis, or are there some things that escape entirely antitrust analysis? Certainly everything in the, that's challenged in this case, uh, uh, because this involves a restriction on the activities of the venturers themselves. But more generally, I would, say, I would answer your question, Justice Ginsburg, to say uh, that, yes, that everything that these 32 separately owned and controlled teams joined together to do by, in concert, by agreement, by consent, is a contract. Changes in the, in the rule of play, they make a change to make it uh, give the passer more protection, but there's this really hurts certain teams which mostly run, and so it's rule of reason. Uh, yes, it's concerted activity. I don't think it would be a plausible rule of reason claim. Well, uh, how do you, you know the litigation system. How do we know? Well, I, th I think we know the following, uh, Justice Kennedy, that under this Court's rule of reasons uh, jurisprudence, uh, a plaintiff has to be able to plead an identifiable anti-competitive effect in a market in which the defendant plausibly has market power, uh, and the, the plaintiff also has to be one who can — Well, my, my hypothetical, two or three teams, uh, which aren't particularly popular in the league, uh, are, are hurt by the rule change. And, and, notice, well, that, that, and notice there's the, 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 
owners sit around the room, they're liable for a conspiracy. I mean, this is serious stuff, triple damages. I, I, I don't I, and I, my question really was the same as Justice Ginsburg. Can you give us a zone um, where we're, we're, we're sure a rule of reason uh, in, inquiry will be, will be inappropriate? We can take care of it on summary judgment, because if, if you don't have some sort of Section 1 carve-out for joint action, then, then everything's under the rule of reason. Well, uh, Justice Kennedy, let me, let me answer your question in two parts. First of all, to the extent that the Court's looking for a zone, the concerted conduct doctrine is the wrong place to do it. Because, remember, if, if something is deemed not to be concerted conduct, it is a per se, then it's per se not subject to Section 1 and per se legal. And I think f- for the Court's jurisprudence over the last 30 years, the Court has been trying to get out of per se rules and have a more uh, focused uh, uh, inquiry into what the anti-competitive effects and pro-competitive effects of a particular restraint are. The concerted conduct doctrine would be a very blunt tool to use for that purpose. Now, that is not to say, and I under- appreciate your question, uh, in the NCAA case itself, where conditions of competition and the like were raised, Justice Stevens' opinion for the Court says that in contrast to the TV restraint, these other types of rules and regulations of the sports league are presumptively competitive, pro-competitive, presum- presumptively favorable to consumers because they are integral and bound up with the creation of the football venture itself. Well, let me give you a- another example that you mention in your brief. Uh, you, the NFL teams agree among themselves uh, regarding scheduling. They'll play 16 games a year and they'll have a playoff schedule and they won't play any other games. Now, would that be a clear case under the rule of reason? You mentioned, and I, some of your amici mentioned, that, for example, the English football leagues operate very differently. Uh, J- Justice Alito, uh, um, if I, I may not have gotten all of your questions, let me answer it in two parts. Uh, the antitrust laws do not require joint ventures to maximize output. They don't require joint ventures to maximize competition. They simply prohibit... Uh, 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 people entering into contracts from unreasonably restraining trade. So a mere agreement among the team owners that they would have a 14-game schedule rather than a 16-game schedule is not a prima facie showing of an anti-competitive in- impact because all it's showing us is what the joint ventures have done with their own output. They have, you haven't alleged a market-wide reduction in output. Now, if by your question you were saying well, what if one, addition- of the team wants to, one of the teams wants to play – uh, additional games. Well, it's the rival team, well, they'll get more money. What I, what I was going to jump right to is if, in addition to res, uh, changing the league schedule, the team owners in concert agreed to prohibit the teams of the National Football League uh, from, enge- uh, from playing any other games, doing an exhibition game in Japan, uh, the Redskins and the Giants playing another game, that might show a market-wide uh, 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 reduction in output. And the Court's decision in NCAA uh, says very specifically that the most important condition of ensuring the competitiveness of joint ventures is ensuring the freedom of the individual venturers to produce output, increase output. Now, that doesn't mean that a league rule of that type would be unlawful. All I'm trying to suggest is if, in addition to changing the schedule of games for the league, they also imposed a restriction on the individual ventures from producing additional games on their own, we might have something that looked more like a plausible rule of risk. They couldn't, they couldn't stop that team from joining another league? Well, let's assume, and I, you know, I don't know enough about football, but let's assume there are two leagues playing. One of them plays on Saturday and the other plays on Sunday. You're suggesting that um, – the je- venture couldn't stop their members from joining that other league? What's the purpose of being in a venture if, if you're free to reject it and go to somewhere well, else? What, what I'm saying is, first of all, it would plainly be concerted activity on the part of the team owners uh, because they would have entered into a horizontal restraint on the activity of the venturers. Whether or not that horizontal restraint uh, violated the antitrust laws, one would have to go through the following analysis, Justice Sotomayor. 
First, we would ask whether or not that restriction is an ancillary a, a, a ancillary restraint. Uh, and an ancillary restraint, starting with uh, Judge Taft, later Chief Justice Taft's opinion in the Addison Pipe cases, is that restriction reasonably necessary to achieve the efficiency-enhancing purposes of the joint venture, and is it no broader than necessary? And it if it is, then we would analyze that restraint by reference not only to its own pro-competitive benefits and anti-competitive effects, we would analyze it by reference to the benefits of the joint venture as a whole. Counsel, it seems to me your, your last few answers seem to me to beg the question. You start out by saying, well, obviously it's a horizontal agreement among the teams, and then you explain how you're going to analyze it. I thought that was the very question before us, whether these sorts of rules and regulations are horizontal uh, uh, agreements between the teams or whether they are part of a particular, a single entity's uh, articulation of rules. Well, Mr. Chief Justice, you're exactly right. And the, the that you've been begging the question? Is that <laughs> <laughs> that part? <laughs> well, uh, let me uh, try to address the, uh, Justice Sotomayor's uh, substantive question in the context of the way you're posing the question, Mr. Chief Justice. The reason it's a horizontal restraint is because these, under the Court's doctrine, consistent teachings, whether it be Sealy, BMI, Copperweld, uh, these teams are separately owned. They're separate decision makers joining together. And they're making a decision about how they're going to jointly produce something or not produce something. And that's what makes it concerted activity under this Court's consistent teachings. The distinction between unilateral activity under Section 1 and, and concerted activity under Section 1 has consistently been the distinction between ownership integration of assets can I, can and contract Can I interrupt with this question? Is it not part of your burden not only to argue there are multiple actors, but also that their agreement has an adverse effect on competition? It absolutely is the plaintiff in the case, uh, Justice Stevens, that we do. That is not the ground of decision. I understand it isn't, but it is part of your burden to, to say that this is not a pro-competitive uh, agreement. A absolutely. And not, not here. In the con I'm sorry, Justice? Not here. I, I don't have to argue. I mean, I don't think I have to argue in this court. I obviously have to answer your questions. Well, but if well, you if we find for you and it goes back... Then you would, you would bear that burden. That's correct. And in fact, in this case, Ju Justice Stevens, I would point out that the NFL initially moved to dismiss, uh, the, the rule of reason count on the ground that it didn't state a, uh, a cognizable, plausible rule of reason came. And the district court judge denied that motion. He found that the complaint alleged a market in which, uh, he could not say as a matter of law that the NFL defendants did not have market power. And he recognized that the, the, that the teams had uh, agreed together to prohibit competition in an aspect of their licensing activity and in an aspect of their merchandise. How does it work? What if, he, what if he further concluded that the agreement had the overall effect of, in, of stimulating additional — it was pro-competitive in that it would equalize the economic strength of the teams and therefore made them all better competitors on the playing field? Would that have been a defense? I'm sorry, Justice Stevens, I'm not quite sure. I thought you're saying if in, in the response to a motion to dismiss, right. he had, had he held. He said, sure, there's an agreement here, but the, the burden is on the plaintiff to show that the agreement has an adverse effect on competition. <clears throat> and that the, as I understand the facts, you, that the revenue sharing here, isn't there? <laughs> that they, they all share in the, in the product of the, the sales well, of the joint product. Let, let me explain what they've done, and I'll uh, then explain why uh, it does have a identifiable anti-competitive effects, which certainly satisfy uh, the pleading standards uh, for a rule of reason claim. Uh, the, what the teams did here was they got together and they agreed that they would not themselves individually license their trademarks or logos, they agreed that they, it, what, under the, the current market system, included the issuance of multiple blanket licenses. They would eliminate all but one of those blanket licenses from the market, and they would give it in the exclusive control uh, of Reebok, and uh, they would limit uh, the circumstances in which they competed against each other and with Reebok. Right, so I, thought, I thought, as I read your complaint, almost every word of it had to do with pro -se, per se violations. So I forget those here, right? The per se violation forget is dismissed. It. Yes or no? I, I forget. Not, not before okay. the court. Now, I've suddenly heard you talk. The only thing left I could see was where you say, by their agreement to grant an exclusive license to Reebok, they've unreasonably restrained trade in the markets. That's the one I'm supposed to focus on. 
Well, no, what I, what I would uh, say, uh, General, What other paragraph do you want me to focus on? Well, I, what I would uh, point you to is the s- statement, I mean, if, if No, I'm interested in the complaint at the moment. Well, the, what the complaint talks about is the granting of an exclusive yeah, license. okay, so I'm looking the at the complaint. exclusivity uh, as uh, Fine, I get the point. I'm asking a question. And I, wa- I just heard you say that you want, for example, where it, where it, you want the Patriots to sell T-shirts in competition with the Saints or whoever, the Red Sox. <laughs> All right, you see the point? The Reds, I know baseball better. You want, the, you want the Red Sox to compete in selling T-shirts with the Yankees. Is that right? The ability. To yes, compete, okay. Yes. I don't know a Red Sox fan who would take a Yankee sweatshirt if you gave it away. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you're going to get your expert from that's going to say there's competition well, between those two products. I think they would rather they would rather wear a baseball, a football, a, a, a hockey shirt. So, so, I understand the, the but point. But you're going to go back and prove that actually there is competition. Well, I understand the point you're making. I would also make the point that is that what this case is about? Uh, in part, but you, you got to recognize what the competition is for. The competition is for fans. Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is, you're right that someone who has lived in New York City uh, for a long time is unlikely to be a Red Sox fan and easily be persuaded to be a Red Sox fan. But the person who is three years old can easily be persuaded. Have very small allowances, the three years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think, I guess you'd have a right to that. I'm not, you have a right, but that's what you're going to have to try well, to prove. But the other point I would make to you is that's just showing that each team has substantial market power. Yeah. And again, they I'm have I'm trying a- to look at what I'm trying to get in my mind is what specific restraint you're focusing on. You listed three or four, and one of them is you want, in effect, I'm joking about it, but it's the truth, you're arguing that the Yankees should compete with the Red Sox in selling shirts. Another thing you're complaining about, which is the one I understand less, is that these teams got together and they agreed that they would just have one person sell all this stuff together. And what you think is that they individually should have decided whether to choose that one person or maybe to choose two people or three. Is that right? Not quite. Uh, Mr. Dagan, well, do I have to figure this out here? Is, is, is this no. issue before us here? Or is it just the issue of whether the lower court was wrong to dismiss your suit on the basis that this is a unitary operation. You're I think right. That was the only issue. That is the only issue. Well, why am I worrying about this other stuff? Uh, because counsel has an obligation to respond to questions posed by. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I find I appreciate. It, I find it easier to think blocker. about a case if I know what's going on, and I'm not certain this is irrelevant. But given Justice Scalia's persuasive remark, I will withdraw <laughs> my question. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Well, well but, it, but it seems to me what we're doing is exploring the, the consequences of completely discarding the, the unitary theory. Well, we're not. And so, and the, 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 the earlier questions, it, it seemed to me, were, were helpful, the, the, the Saturday-Sunday scheduling issue, uh, it, it seems to me pretty clearly on its face does limit competition. You, you have uh, one day instead of two days. Then Justice Stevens said, suppose it makes them better players because they're rested and so they can perform better. I take it that was the purpose of the question. And I, I still don't get any answers. I, I, I don't know where we are with this. The, the answer to I, 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 It's a difficult area, uh, but, I li- and, and, but I'd like some guidance. Well, well, the guidance I would give you, Justice Kennedy, is that, as Justice Scalia says, the only question before the Court is whether or not uh, th- these agreements uh, constitute concerted activity. Uh, they plainly do because they are agreements between separately owned uh, 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 and controlled competing businesses. Mr. Nigger, uh, I think you answered my question originally. Yes, everything, because they are separate entities. They agree on everything. There's agreement in every case. So there's nothing that you would take outside and you put everything under the rule of reason analysis. Th- that, that is uh, correct, but that doesn't mean that the rule of reason is some unstructured, indeterminate. But one, one concern in the litigation is, you know, if it doesn't come under the Sherman Act at all, they go home after the case is dismissed uh, on, the, on the pleadings. But once you say, you know, it's got to be a rule of reason analysis, then you have discovery, 
which can be costly, and I thought that that was a feature of this case, that uh, the, the, the plaintiff wanted more discovery, and the Court said, you've had enough. Well, no, the, the, the judge only allowed discovery on the single entity issue. He did not allow discovery uh, on the rule of reason question. So there's been not been — discovery on the substance of the case uh, uh, has not been conducted. Um, so in, in that regard, the question of how the case would be managed going forward is something that would be in the hands of the district court um, on remand from this court and the Court of Appeals after this erroneous uh, conclusion that the agreements don't constitute concerted conduct is put to the side. Uh, also, could you articulate for me uh, as succinctly as possible the extent to which your position dis, uh, d- departs from the position of the Solicitor General? The p- Solicitor General's position is uh, uh, correct insofar as it criticizes the Seventh Circuit reasoning. The test that the Solicitor General proposes is conceptually and doctrinally uh, uh, unsound, and it will create a lack of clarity where there presently exists clarity in the cases, and it will produce inefficiency and waste in the conduct of litigation that does not presently exist. And I well, I would have thought it's just a transfer of the inefficiency and lack of clarity from the, the uh, first question to the rule of reason. I mean, I'm not quite sure it — you don't have the same problem. It's just a question of where you want to uh, rest the inefficiency and confusion. Well, uh, I understand your point, Mr. Chief Justice, that to, to the extent that rule of reason inquiries uh, are uh, not as refined as they need to be, uh, since the Solicitor General's concerted conduct inquiry includes rule of reason inquiries, inclu- indeed on its effective merger standard, it says it has to survive a rule of reason analysis or somehow be waived, uh, or you'd have to do it as part of the concerted conduct inquiry. Uh, so that there, there's no doubt to the extent that, that the rule of reason is a continuing project of this Court, we would be transferring some of that project into the concerted conduct inquiry. With all respect, Mr. Chief Justice, I don't think that would be a healthy development in the law. The courts actually understand the concerted conduct doctrine as it presently exists. Well, I I thought the purpose of their submission was to respond to some of the questions we've seen, like scheduling, uh, like what the rules are going to be about about the game. There's some things that it just seems odd to subject to a rule of reason analysis. And you yourself have said, well, that's going to be an easy case under the rule of reason. Why doesn't it make sense to sort of carve those out at the outset rather than at the end of the case? Uh, well, I, th- I think the answer is you should, you should use English language and doctrine to address the issue that you're actually uh, trying to address rather than call it something else. Right now, we, we have an antitrust doctrine that says you've, you've got to have concerted conduct and you have to have an unreasonable restraint of trade. We have courts that understand how to apply this court's cases on concerted conduct. This Court, is, for understandable reasons, is sensitive uh, uh, to the fact that the rule of reason uh, is not quite as well understood and is a evolutionary doctrine, perfectly well understood uh, by me. There are certain issues, this Court has said, come up in a rule of reason analysis, and to quote uh, the Court from Cal Dental, uh, can be dealt with in the twinkling of an eye. That is, some claims, as the NCAA court said, uh, are not going to be serious rule of reason claims and can be dismissed on the pleadings. The court said that in Twombly as well. And as I understand your position, that could be the result in this case. We don't know whether the district court was right or wrong in what he did on the on the rule of reason issue. In, in, in terms of what this Court, obviously for, on my client's behalf, I have to vigorously state to the Court, we think we have a bona fide, serious rule of reason claim. But yes, Justice Stevens. And, uh, and one thing I wondered about the record, there's discussion in the briefs about the fact that the teams share the revenues from these, uh, these sales. Is that, how did that get in the record? The, the revenue sharing aspect of their uh, the different teams participate. Well, I, I didn't handle the case below, so I don't quite know how it got into the record. It is my certainly my understanding that, that there is an affidavit in the record that says that the revenues that the NFLP entity receives are distributed to the teams in equal shares. Um, 
So, so that — Wouldn't — it wouldn't that, that affidavit support the conclusion that this is basically a pro-competitive agreement because it tends to make competition stronger on the playing field? And therefore, that's a sufficient defense under the rule of reason. And that's the end of the ballgame. I, I think not. Well, but you have to remember that that agreement to not compete and have only one entity — yeah, but, the, but you're not that, just That's competing. the very thing the case challenges. With regard to sales of, of the paraphernalia and so forth you have here, you're not just competing among the members of the league. You're competing in a market that includes all sports paraphernalia. No, no our market was alleged and held not to be legally invalid by the district court to be NFL uh, logoed hats and apparel. And that assumes there's no competition between the sales of those logo and the sales of other sports logo. Well, that, that's correct. And the j- district court judge held that that was a, based upon this court's decision in NCAA and the international boxing case, was a plausible market in, uh, to allege in which the NFL teams had uh, market power. And so it would be a question for the district court uh, managing the case going forward to determine whether or not that was a, a factually supportable uh, 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 market. With the Council, you, um, the Solicitor General is asking us to remand under his new th- test to find out whether you're challenging the joint venture or challenging <coughs> simply the licensing to one individual uh, or one entity. What are you doing? Do you have an answer to that? Well, the, the, the answer is, is that as Meaning I don't uh, — <laughs> I understand. The, 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 the uh, American Needle said in the court below that what it was challenging was uh, the uh, grant of an exclusive license to NFLP that prohibited the individual team competition and eliminated all competition in the market in blanket licenses. When the case came to this court — uh, on page two of the orange brief, the NFL said they understood exactly what our case was. This is on page two, the second sentence. American Needle alleged that the decades-old agreement among the mem- member clubs to collectively market such intellectual property was unlawful under sections one and two of the Sherman Act, at least after the 2001 decision to collectively license the marks to a single headwear manufacturer. The NFL stu- understood exactly what we were arguing, and they've understood it throughout this case, as did the lower courts. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the Solicitor General doesn't understand it. Is your point is that your client wasn't hurt until they dealt exclusively with one manufacturer? That, that's correct, Justice. So, so you had nothing, you had no damages before? Before. With Thank you, Mr. Nagy. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, I think that by focusing on a rather mundane aspect of the NFL Commissioner's powers, it, this may help to explain why the United States is not four square in support of either party's theory in this case. Among the powers that is vested in the Commissioner by the NFL, by the NFL Constitution is the power to incur expenses to carry on the ordinary business of the League, and this includes renting office space, hiring employees, and procuring supplies. And if the Commissioner, pursuant to that delegation of authority, decides from which company he's going to to acquire paper for the League's offices or decides what the wage scale for secretaries in the League offices should be, our view is that that's the conduct of a single entity. It may be that the Commissioner's power to do those things is ultimately derived from the consent of the individual teams within the League, but once that consent has been given, once that authority has been centralized, then the Commissioner's decision about uh, a paper supplier or wages for employees. And then the question I have, well, I now understand this much better in light of that. And, and but, but I don't, and I, and I see your point, what I'm not certain about is, is it better to characterize it as a single entity, in which case we get into the kind of confusion that I think is, exists in this case, or just say, look, it's a joint venture. If Panagra creates a joint venture, of course they're going to buy things like office space and employees, so it's reasonable. By definition, we don't even look into it. Those things that are close enough to take your criteria from 17, page 17, which are excellent criteria in my mind, and, and you say, these are the criteria by which we decide whether those ancillary parts of a joint venture that is itself reasonable 
are also reasonable. I guess we'd say two things. The first is, up to now, there's been no such thing in the law as concerted action that is per se legal or per se. No, no, we wouldn't say per se. We're saying that the justification here, they're reasonable. Why are they reasonable? Because there is a legitimate joint venture, and this is an ancillary part of that legitimate joint venture. People can attack it. But it's going to be no easier to attack than if they tried to attack what you call a single entity. I guess my point is that if, for instance, a, a disappointed uh, bidder for the paper supply conduct, contract challenged this as a Section 1 violation and said the Commissioner's decision to go to Staples rather than Office Depot no, was unreasonable because no, no. Office Depot was offering a better product at a lower price. There, there are certainly decisions that the Commissioner could make with respect mm-hmm. to procurement of supplies or the setting of wage levels that would be unreasonable in a business judgment sense and that they wouldn't effectively carry on the mission of the organization, but they wouldn't be unreasonable in the the Section 1 sense. And the other thing I would say is that line of argument could have been made in Copperwell. That is, the Court could have concluded that — Copperwell, look, your second criteria opens it up to attack in precisely the same way that my use of rule of reason does, because they're going to have to show it doesn't significantly affect actual or potential competition. Therefore, they file their claim. They say they win under the second criteria. That's precisely the same as a person filing his claim and saying it's unreasonable. We're only talking terminology, but what worries me about this is the terminology, because I think that the lower courts have taken Copperweld terminology and transferred it to a place where it does, I think, perhaps not belong. Well, well, in Dogger, for instance, the Court was dealing with a situation that's in some ways analogous to the one that you have here, that is, a joint venture in which entities that were economic competitors in some aspects of their businesses joined forces with respect to other aspects. And the Court in Dogger didn't squarely resolve the questions whether Section 1 applied, but it said that in pricing its products, Equilon, the joint venture, was acting as a single firm, a single entity. The the other point I'd like to make about my, my paper and employee example is that in our view, the NFL commissioner, when carrying out those functions on behalf of the league, would be acting as a single entity, even though his power was derived from the consent of the teams. But if the Jets and the Giants agreed among themselves as to what wages they would pay their secretaries or from whom they would buy paper, that would be an entirely different thing. The fact that those teams are, for some purposes, May I part ask of you a- this question, Mr. Seward. Would the antitrust issue before us be any different? If instead of giving an exclusive contract to one purveyor of the product, the the commissioner had entered into a multitude of different contracts which specified a minimum price in every one he specified. I I think the section — the question whether Section 1 applied would not be any different. That is, is, the the central Section 1 — So the the, fact that this is an exclusive agreement is kind of a red herring in this case. It it may not be a red herring with respect to the ultimate — a resolution of the case. That is, if the court on the lower court on remand, if the case were remanded, applied rule of reason analysis, that the precise nature of the contract might bear on whether the restraint was reasonable, but it wouldn't bear on the question whether concerted activity was involved. That is, I, I don't one, under, I'm sorry. Why, I'm I, I guess my point was, one, once the teams decided that they would rather than each negotiating individually, either with a single licensee or with multiple licensees, once they decided that they would negotiate as a collective and that any potential licensee had to go to the collective rather than to the individual teams, that's the central Section 1 issue. And if the the collective had decided we will give contracts to a multitude of potential bidders, that would not have affected the fact that uh, concerted action was involved. So under your your following of your paper, uh, Case, are you saying that if the teams delegated to the commissioner the authority to decide whether we're going to enter, whether the league is going to enter into one contract on a logo products or let each team decide, that would be all right? That, would, that initial delegation of authority would be subject to Section 1 challenge because that would be concerted action in the same way that the court in Dogger said. Well, why isn't the decision to order paper from one company rather than another subject to Section 1 challenge? Because that, that occurs after the point at which the commissioner has been vested with that authority. If somehow a plaintiff wanted to say 
there was an, there was illicit concerted action when the teams agreed to give the commissioner this general power. That would be subject to Section 1 review, it seems, because that would be concerted action. It seems highly unlikely that such a challenge would prevail. But if Why the, is that? I mean, if I'm Office Depot and I'm selling paper to the uh, — uh, to the Giants. Or does this only apply to the Commissioner's office? This only applies to carrying out the ordinary business of the League. It, it would only apply to the Commissioner's running of, of the League office, not the, the running of the individual teams. And as I say, our, our central point is that — Could I, using your example, could you tell me what the different questions would be under the single control theory you're proposing — and a rule of reason application in its normal course. So what are the questions you would ask under your theory, and how do they differ from what would happen under a rule of reason analysis? I guess under our theory, we would first ask, as to an entity like this, which is entities that compete in some respects. Let's let's not go into this case. Let's, Let's stay with your single commissioner. I think we would ask first, is, is the Commissioner acting as a single entity when he exercises delegated authority in making a business judgment about w- which supplier to buy paper or what the wages should be? If the answer is yes, then the Section 1 inquiry is over. Then the case is no different from a challenge to the — Well, how does that stop any group of competitors from coming in and saying, gee, I want to sell my gas, I'm going to — let the single commissioner decide how much my gas will sell for, and if he chooses to sell it at the same price to everybody, both gas products, that's okay. How do you get to that? Well, I think if a single business uh, is deciding whether to buy paper from one supplier or from several, that wouldn't be subject to Section 1 review because the decision of the single business might affect the welfare of the competitors, but it wouldn't be concerted action. And our point is that when — I think the way in which our position differs from that of the two parties is that, on the one hand, I think it is the logical implication of petitioner's position that because the commissioner's authority to buy supplies for the League or hire referees for the League is ultimately derived from the consent of the individual teams who are independently owned, the logic of positioner's position suggests that that would be subject to Section 1 scrutiny. On the other hand, the logic of the NFL's position suggests that because the commissioner can set price, can decide from whom to buy paper on behalf of the league, the Jets and the Giants could reach a similar agreement, or the Jets and the Giants could agree on the prices they'll pay secretaries. No, 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 because they're not part of the broader concerted entity. There's no separate uh, — uh, you're, you're saying, well, just because all 32 teams can act as, a, as an individual entity, any group of those teams can act as an individual I, I think that follows logically from the position that this is one entity, because in Copperweld, for instance, the Court noted that coordination between different divisions of — a single company would not be subject to Section 1 scrutiny. And that implies not just all, that all the divisions could get together, but that any two could confer among themselves without raising Section 1 concerns. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Levy. Good morning, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. <clears throat> the formation of a professional sports league, like the formation of any joint venture, may be subject to Section 1 scrutiny. Were it not for an act of Congress, the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League in 1970 would be one such example. But there is no challenge to venture formation here. There is no dispute that the NFL, including its licensing arm, NFL Properties, is a lawful venture. If venture formation is not an issue, then decisions by the venture, about the venture's product, are unilateral venture decisions, unilateral venture actions. They're not concerted actions of of the venture's members. Well, well, do we have to ask uh, what was the intent at the beginning? It's kind of an originalism thing. Everybody uh, sits around and says, let's have a football league. And 20 years later, they say, you know, the sale of hats and shirts is a pretty good thing. Let's get into that business. That would, that would, that's case one. Uh, Case two is when they formed the league initially, um, 30 years ago, they said, and be sure we'll, we'll, we'll sell hats and 
So I, I, I don't understand the base point from which I f uh, find that this, that this is a single entity. Your Honor, we know here that at least as of 1963, when NFL Properties was formed, that there was a single entity formed, a single entity to produce and promote NFL football. Now, I take issue with your suggestion, your implication, that there was a decision made here, let's set up a separate line of business, we're going to sell hats also. That's not what happened, and the record on that is unambiguously clear here. It's undisputed. The well, but do you take issue with my, my question that this is a relevant inquiry? Is it part of the original agreement or isn't it? And why is it that the original agreement is somehow sacrosanct? I don't understand. I'm not suggesting that the original agreement is sacrosanct. That's why I suggested that by 1963 or the mid-1960s, when NFL Properties was formed, there was venture formation at that point. At that point, what was the question? The question was, how should the League, how should the venture members best promote the venture product? And the decision was made to use the licenses of their intellectual property as a promotional tool. And on that issue, the discovery and the record below was undisputed. There's documentary evidence from the NFL Properties Articles of Incorporation. There's testimony from an NFL executive, Mr. Gertzog. And the best proof, if there were any question about that, is reflected in the, the — uh, the organic documents of NFL properties, which at the outset said that if there were any net revenues from the licensing activities, they would be donated to charitable and educational causes. Now, you know, Dogger confirmed the general principle that if the venture is lawfully formed, the venture's decisions about uh, uh, how best to produce and promote its product uh, are, uh, are venture decisions, not the decisions of the venture members. But Copperweld provides the framework that decides the issue here. And neither Mr. Stewart nor Mr. Nager mentioned Copperweld except in passing. Copperweld is the case by which this Court turned the page, if you will, on the formalism of prior cases, including Seeley, which may, Mr. Nager. May I ask you to go back just one step, because you seem to treat this as though the NFLP was formed in 1963 and that was the end of it. But another description is well, it was formed, but then there were some teams that were not in it until later, and there were some other parts that it has expanded. What it does has expanded since 1963. So there wasn't one point in time where there was formation, and then um, if you didn't, if, you, if you're not challenging that, everything else is okay. Well, I, I don't disagree with that, Your Honor. I think that. In 1970, the league expanded. There was a merger. That merger of the National Football League and the American Football League would have been subject to Section 1 challenge because it involved venture formation, but an act of Congress said that that wasn't necessary. After 1970, there have been six teams, I believe, that have been added, essentially created, if you will, like Adam's rib, they've been created from uh, the other NFL clubs, but it's essentially the same venture. The venture has expanded its production capability by adding new teams. It's expanded its output by adding new teams. And the role of licensing of intellectual property throughout that process has remained the same. The role has been to promote the venture's product. It's not — Excuse me. Did the teams — did the NFL properties or some centralized entity always exploit the trademarks of all the franchises, or was there a long period of time in which they each individually franchised their product? The, the record, Your Honor, says, reflects, that there was very little exploitation of uh, intellectual property of the franchises prior to the creation of NFL properties. But there was some, and that was uh, done by the individual teams. It was done, and it was done — I mean, that's sort of a historic artifact. It was done, I believe, collectively through Roy Rogers Enterprises. But, but the, the, the teams continued to own their intellectual property. That's right. The, the problem that I see for you in this case is that the basic conclusion is in the Court of Appeals, where it says, viewed in this light, the NFL teams are best described as a single source of economic power when promoting NFL football through licensing. Well, how do we know that? Well, their allegation is that that isn't true. The, and, and, I, and I have — and Copperwell just seems to me to be very confusing on this, since, Copper, since my Hornbook knowledge of it 
was we have Copperwell to deal with the case that we don't make booths in department stores compete in price against each other. All right? Normally, however, uh, we say interdependent enders can't get together and say they fix prices. That's per se. And joint ventures are in the middle. So we apply a rule of reason. Now, very simple. I thought that's been the law since Panagra. I don't know what, in fact, a copper weld has to do with it. Uh, and uh, they're saying that this basic joint venture for promoting is not a reasonable agreement. So why shouldn't they have their shot? You might well win. But they want to make that claim. The reason we know that this is not your typical joint venture is because Copperweld established a standard that said that what Section 1 is intended to regulate is not matters of form, not general market conditions, but rather the sudden joining together of independent sources of economic power. Fine, but that's, that's the conclusion the here. That's not the — that's the conclusion. You're, the question is, should they be permitted to join their centers of economic power into one when they promote and sell their T-shirts, sweatshirts, etc. Now, you can't answer that question by announcing the conclusion. But, Your Honor, we know that they are not independent sources of economic power because none of them can produce the product of the venture on their own. No NFL club can produce a single unit of production, a single game. They can't it ask someone to do that? Oh, you're saying the game. That's, what is the game to do with this? I thought we were talking about T-shirts and, and helmets, and I, I thought it's the simplest thing in the world. You pick up the phone and say, hello, Shanghai, do you have a helmet? <laughs> Your Honor, if, if this were a venture designed to go out and license or manufacture or distribute caps, you'd be right. But this is different. And we've de the undisputed evidence in the record below demonstrates it's different. It's different because the purpose of the licensing here is to promote the product. It's to promote the game. And the NFL member clubs are not independent sources of economic power in generating that game. Is this a summary judgment motion? Yes, it was a summary judgment. The purpose is to promote the game. The purpose is to make money. I don't think that they care whether the sale of the helmet or the T-shirt promotes the game. They, they sell it to make money from the sale. I, now, it promotes the game if the money from the sale goes to the whole group, I suppose. But, 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 but don't tell me that there is not, absent this agreement, there would not be an independent individual incentive for each of the teams to sell as many of its own, of its own shirts and helmets <coughs> as possible. Your Honor, I'd agree with you 100 percent that the purpose of the licensing is to make money but not necessarily to make money through the royalties. The purpose of the licensing is to improve and promote the attractiveness of the game product, to get more people interested in watching the games on television, to get more people interested in buying tickets to the game. Well, I suppose that, 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 and, could, that, that issue could be tried. And, and for, but I don't, I, I don't think so. And, and I suppose that's a tribal you, issue as to whether the purpose of of selling these things is to promote the whole NFL or to promote the particular team in, that, in, that wants its own adherence and wants to sell its own product. In the abstract, that's a triable issue, Your Honor, but not here. Here the record was undisputed. There's evidence in the record on that point. The record, there is evidentiary, there is documentary evidence. There is evidence that goes back to the organic documents of NFL properties. And as I, as I mentioned before, in the early days, the, the net revenues, if any, the net royalties of the licensing operations went to charity. So there's no, there's no question here. Discovery was allowed on this issue, and the record is undisputed. So we have a classic case, a perfect clean opportunity for this Court to apply the principles of Copperwell and the principles of Dogger to an area of the law that has been troubled for many years. Since 1984, the courts have wrestled with the question of how to deal with professional sports leagues and Section 1 claims against professional sports leagues. And the cases, the, the courts have been, have, and with the exception of this case and the Bulls 2 case, the courts have been guided principally by pre-Copperweld precedent that rests on an era of formalism, an era when even an agreement between a parent and its subsidiary What decision could the sports teams make that would be subject to the antitrust scrutiny under your definition of 
the permissible range of the joint venture activities. It seems to me that if the venture wanted to make sure all the teams hired secretaries at the same $1,000 a year salary, that under your theory, that's okay because it's a joint venture. Your Honor, my view is that the, the NFL clubs are not separate ses- sor- sources of independent power. As a result, they are a unit. They are a, a so single entity. So the answer to my question is relates- there is you are seeking through this ruling what you haven't gotten from Congress an absolute bar to an antitrust claim. No, Your Honor, that's not right. So, so answer you, my question. The, what the direct decision? answer to your question is this. With regard to Section 1 claims, let's put aside Section 2 claims. Let's put aside claims between the NFL and other leagues. Let's put aside claims that relate to non-venture conduct, like the example of creating a trucking company that's reflected in our brief. The uh, I can understand an argument, and we suggested as much in our brief below, that if the league engages in a practice of representing itself, going to the market, uh, the clubs go to market as independent entities. I can see an argument that would basically say, based on estoppel principles, that they should not be able to agree on, uh, on uniform prices or uniform wages for secretaries, for example. We did it. We, we made the point in our brief in the context of, of coaches. Uh, but even in, even in the context of coaches, put aside for a moment, Section 2 remains available to the coaches if, in fact, they can demonstrate that there has been monopolization or attempted monopolization of a market. But the line that I draw is the line between production and promotion of the game. Coaches are closer to production and promotion of the game than secretaries. But I, you know, there, there may be some, some gap there. But, um, but as long as the NFL clubs are, are members of a unit, if they compete as a unit in the entertainment marketplace, as to use the language that Justice Rehnquist used, they should be deemed a single entity and not subject to Section 1 of the Now, the question is, are you basing that on economic-related data about the pros and the cons of, uh, 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 you know, the, the economic harms uh, of uh, stopping them from competing versus the economic benefits of allowing them to act as a separate, as a, as a, as a single entity? Or are you basing it on a pure legal word called single entity? And, and what, what worried, I thought when I read the opinion first of the district court, that he's just following up what I think started in the Seventh Circuit, unfortunately, of uh, taking this word single entity and throwing around all, throwing it around all over the place and, and, and not stopping the economic analysis. But then when I read the last paragraphs of his opinion, he seems to be saying when I go back to the record, which you want me to do, I will discover that there is lots of information showing economic benefit to this venture of promoting together. There's nothing to suggest they could compete. And so it's clear to the point where they don't get to trial that this is a reasonable agreement. All right. Now, is, have I, am I right in thinking what you're thinking? That's not my position, Your Honor. All right. Good. Then my, I want to know what your position is. My position is based on the intended scope of the Sherman Act, Section 1 of the Sherman Act which this Court in Copperweld made clear. The principle is articulated five or six separate times in the Copperweld opinion that Section 1 of the Sherman Act mm. is intended to regulate the sudden joining together of separate sources of economic power. That's, that's, yeah. that's not this well, I, I wouldn't read Copper. Can you read Copperweld as follows? Copperweld <laughs> is ratifying a decision by an entrepreneur or several to organize his entrepreneurial entity as one, where there are obvious efficiencies in doing that, such as it would obviously be inefficient to have the salespeople behind counters in a single department store competing with each other in price. A joint venture is a situation where it's debatable whether or not there is that kind of efficiency in organization. And therefore, we apply a rule of reason. That's Panagra. I don't see anything in Copperweld that's intended to overrule Panagra. And as long as Panagra is not overruled, we would apply at least to major decisions by joint ventures a rule of reason. Now, what is wrong with 
And you might still win on the rule of reason. But why isn't that analysis correct? I'm putting it forward as a hypothesis for you to discuss. The, the analysis is not correct because there has been no challenge to venture formation here. I don't disagree that if there had been a challenge to venture formation here, that the considerations that you identify with, with regard to Panagra would apply. But that's not the case here. There's really no ambiguity about what's been challenged. There is a very definitely a joint venture here to play football, but there, there isn't a joint venture to build houses, and there isn't a joint venture obviously in sight to promote. So they're saying that, that there's such a different activity, the playing of football versus the promotion of a logo, that we ought to go and look under a rule of reason as to whether a joint venture in promoting a logo is justified in terms of competition's harms and economic benefits. Justice Breyer, I agree with you that there is a difference, an important difference, between venture and non-venture activity. If the NFL clubs were to create a trucking company or, in your example, would go off and build houses, that's not a venture activity. Well, it's it would be if they tried to do it. But there, they would be attacked on the ground that, under the rule of reason, they do not have the justification such that the antitrust law would allow them well, to do it. The, and they are saying, and promoting is precisely the same. That's why it seems to me to be something that you can't decide in theory. It's a matter of going back to economic facts with witnesses and so forth. Your Honor, the ancillary restraints doctrine would enable the Court, in the circumstance that you describe, to categorize the decision to build housing as a non-venture activity, a non-venture decision. And therefore, it would be evaluated independently of the considerations that apply to, to the venture's objective. But here you cannot separate the, the, uh, the venture activity of, of uh, uh, well, but promoting you certainly, football. You certainly could, because they certainly could, theoretically, each club could sell its own logo. Each, of course each club could sell its own logo, Your Honor, but the clubs have decided that the most effective way to promote to do it that way, the but clubs it could have, be done. Forgive me, I shouldn't speak over you. The clubs have decided that the most effective way to promote their product, to promote NFL football, is to do so collectively, to ensure that the marks of all 32 clubs are are out there in airports. But maybe they also the collectively decide the best way to make money and finance uh, attendance and so forth, all to agree on a housing program that they're all giant, jointly sponsored. Well, Your, Your Honor, that uh, I respectfully suggest that doesn't. To, to that raise doesn't, money to pay these players who make so much money. Well, th that doesn't. There's a plausibility standard that really has to be applied in terms of the, uh, of the arguments at issue. Well, but if it's a plausibility standard at the threshold inquiry, there's a range of things. And I guess your, your friend on the other side is just saying selling logos is closer to selling houses than it is to playing football. Well, but there's a difference here, Your Honor, because there's a record. This, does, this wasn't decided on a motion to dismiss. It was decided on summary judgment. There was undisputed evidence that the purpose of the licensing, going back 40 years, 45 years at this point, was to promote the game. And that's not an implausible uh, determination to be made, but the, but the evidence was undisputed. The case was decided on summary judgment. Um, and so, you know, this is not a situation where, uh, where there's the type of, you know, the range of issues that needs to be, you know, that needs to be resolved uh, of, of the kind that you describe. Um, you know, this is a situation. So if, a there's judge a factual, Brand, if there's a factual dispute, about whether a particular activity of the league is designed to promote the game or is designed simply to make more money, then that is the sort of thing that goes to trial? Well, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put it in terms of make more money because I've agreed with Justice Scalia. Or do something Scalia, else. Do something other than promote the game. If, if, Your Honor, just as in Dogger, in Dogger the issue was how to price the product. It's a fundamental decision that any venture has to make. This is a decision. The undisputed evidence shows that this is a decision about how to promote the product. And that's no different from pricing a product in terms of the, you know, the, the, uh, the operations of a venture. You can't, you, you can't uh, hope to market a product unless you've decided on how to promote it. And the antitrust laws in the Sherman Act encourage promotion. They encourage, Copperweld encourages 
business people to make the judgment about how best to produce and to promote their product and how best to compete in the marketplace. Um, uh, uh, they made very clearly that they don't want those judgments cabined or inhibited or chilled by, by uh, decisions by the court or decisions by a jury. But here, Judge Moran did what we thought was the, and we continue to think, is the most appropriate way to serve the interests of both the Sherman Act and the considerations that this Court has recognized in Twombly and other cases, and that's to provide an early opportunity for a determination of whether or not the, the venture, uh, the venture conduct, the venture decision that is at issue, is a venture decision of a single entity, or whether it is a collective decision of the uh, of the venture participants. He allowed discovery limited to the sing, single entity issue. The the uh, the, the, the um, uh, there's no challenge to the scope of discovery here. We have a complete record on this point that confirms and addresses the question that you presented, that the purpose of licensing here is to promote the product. But e- even if it weren't, even if it weren't, I'd suggest that, uh, uh, that, that the, the evidence shows that fans identify with the logos, and we're talking about the logos and the marks here, not because they have some sort of intrinsic value, not because they, you know, derive their, they derive some value from their attractiveness or appeal independently in the marketplace. They derive their value from their identification with an NFL club that competes on the football field. And even, e- even uh, American Needle's president uh, so confirmed in the declaration that he submitted in the case. So we have here a, a, a record that makes this, uh, this judgment for the Court relatively straightforward. It provides a, a straightforward opportunity for this to this court to confirm the principles established in um, uh, established in Copperweld, and to and to extend uh, the principles that this court uh, uh, noted in Dogger. If the, if the reasonableness of this decision that T-shirts promotes the game is so self-evident, then why wouldn't the rule of reason control completely? Well, Your Honor, I don't. Why have do any- we need? to even go to the single entity question when, by your own answer, it is undisputed, so abundantly clear, so reasonable. What's the need to to label it single entity as opposed to label it what it is, reasonable? The answer, Your Honor, is inherent in the rule of reason. In In the modern era, Defending a claim like this on the merits involves an investment of tens of millions of dollars, thousands of hours of executive time, hours and hours of court time. In the Salvino case, there were three years of discovery spent on rule of reason issues. But isn't the whole purpose, and and I certainly sympathize with that argument, but isn't the proposition of antitrust law that we have a reason for worrying about concerted activity. We have a genuine concern, as in, or Congress does, about independent entities joining together and fixing prices. And we permit them to do so, as Justice Breyer indicated, when the venture has a purpose that's independent than, from the individual interest. But we say when it doesn't, we have to ensure under the rule of reason that what they are doing is reasonable. I'm I'm very swayed by your arguments, but I can very much see a counter-argument that promoting T-shirts is only to make money. It doesn't really promote the game. It promotes the making of money. And once you fix prices for making money, that's a Sherman Act violation. Your Honor, I'd agree with almost everything that you said. But we're not dealing here with independent sources of economic power. These clubs are not independent. None could produce their product on their own. But they own the trademarks, so they could. They do, but the trademarks don't have any value. They don't have any purpose, independent of the game. The trademarks are invented to identify the clubs on the field. They're, in, I, they're, they're promoted and distributed to, identify, to encourage loyalty among fans uh, of the clubs. The, uh, the trademarks are simply a tool that the, that the clubs use to... So let's to call it NFL supermarket. Red Sox supermarket, 
Patriot's uh, automobile shop, uh, Patriot's tractor store. Everything becomes Patriot's. Everything becomes no competition anywhere. Now, you say that's ridiculous. And once you say that's ridiculous, you're now into the business of deciding whether this aspect of the undeniable legal joint venture to play baseball or football, whether this aspect is properly the subject of merger. And once you're into that, you're into your $7 million, and I can't really think of anything that's going to help you there. Well, and the SG in its brief, you see, on that key 16 and 17, it seemed to me simply reproduces in precisely somewhat different language, but precisely the argument you're now having. Is this the kind of thing that should be merged? We know by applying the rule of reason. And second, if it is merged, is this particular aspect of it something where there could be competition and there isn't much justification? That's their rule, too. Again, we're back to the rule of reason. So how do I save you the $7 million? But, Your Honor, this case is the perfect example. We were able to resolve this case on summary judgment without incurring the burden of rule of reason discovery. And your reference to the Patriots tractor store drives home uh, a, a, a distinction that I think is worth leaving with the Court at this point. This is not a situation like the situation to which we adverted in our brief, where John Deere and International Harvester get together and fix the prices of their logos for sale to cap manufacturers. John Deere and International Harvester for many years, I mean, early on they gave away the hats throughout the Midwest to encourage farmers to buy their farm equipment. They are independent sources of economic power. Well, it, you, you, you say that the, that the trademarks have no value apart from the, from the game. I guess you could say the same thing for each individual franchise of each of the 32 clubs. They're worthless if NFL football disappears. So does that mean they, 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 they can agree to uh, fix the price? at which their, their, their franchises will be sold by concerted agreement? Because, after all, they're worthless apart from the NFL. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with your, your premise, Your Honor, that they are worthless apart from the — except, I mean, there's some residual value. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't dispute, uh, dispute that. Could they agree on prices for their franchises to be sold? Yes, I assume they could agree, because they're not independent sources of economic power. Ooh. So we don't even ask the question whether under the rule of reason such a thing is reasonable or justified? Your Honor. I thought I was reducing it to the absurd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I can bring the basic point that I, uh, I want to leave you with uh, back to an example that's a little bit closer to home. Uh, in, 1999, in 1919, when Judge Covington and Mr. Burling went to uh, uh, join forces, they formed a law firm, a venture. Ninety years later, that venture decides on the prices, the rates that Mr. Ludwin and I will, will uh, uh, decide for our — will charge for our services. Sometimes that venture, the firm, decides that we won't do business with a particular client or that we'll limit our business uh, to a particular client in a particular industry. Nobody suggests that that decision of the venture, a lawful venture, is subject to Section 1 scrutiny as a violation of the Sherman Act, constitutes a, re a concerted refusal to deal. But if Mr. Ludwin and I leave the, leave the firm and we set up solo practices and then decide on what our rates are going to be or then decide on what, our, uh, what clients we will serve and not serve, that is an agreement between independent competitors. That's the fundamental difference uh, but that is a fundamentally different situation between the, uh, uh, compared to the situation of the firm setting our rates. And it reflects the intersection of Copperweld and Dogger. It shows how Dogger and Copperweld fit together hand in glove to demonstrate that the NFL, for purposes of promoting its football product, is a single entity. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Mr. Nager, you have three minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I'd just like to pick up on the question that Chief Justice Roberts asked me with the point uh, that Justice Breyer made, which is that both the Solicitor General's position and the NFL's position are taking rule of reason concepts and trying to push them into the concerted conduct inquiry. 
which will have the effect, of course, of confusing courts that presently understand the inquiry. That's Justice Breyer's point about terminology. It also has substantive impact because of the way litigation gets conduct- conducted. As Mr. Levy has said, this case was litigated below at the district court judge's distract, uh, direction only on the concerted conduct question, not on the, the rule of reason question. So American Needle didn't have the opportunity to conduct discovery and make proof about anti-competitive effects and to try to rebut the arguments that the NFL was making about pro-competitive justifications. The NFL's is argument is asking — they are asking for a per se rule of legality <laughs> for everything that the NFL does that is related to football. That can't what, what's be the answer to the What's the answer to the hypothetical uh, Mr. Levy ended with? On the, par- law firm. the partnership example. Well, the partnership is, is, is as follows. As, as to the extent that there's case law on the subject, as with all joint ventures, uh, the case law treats par- uh, law firm partnerships as joint ventures and subjects them to the rule of reason. And every commentator, whether it be Judge Bork or anyone else, has said, but, of course, law firms don't have market power. <laughs> Uh, so they couldn't possibly have uh, any competitive effects on the market. And a rule of reason claim trying to challenge the rates at which a law firm sets its partnership rates uh, wouldn't pa- survive a motion to dismiss. With respect to his analogy to Dogger, the difference between the Dogger effects, of course, this Court didn't in Dogger accept the argument that I made on behalf of Texaco and uh, Shell that they should be treated as a single entity if, in fact, their formation was lawful. This Court only ruled on the, on the price-fixing issue. But the argument that was made in Dogger was if you had a wholly integrated joint venture, one in which there had been a complete pooling of relevant capital, a complete sharing of profits and losses, and an enforceable non-compete agreement, in those circumstances, Re- the, the owners of that joint venture were not like typical joint venturers. They, in fact, were like the shareholders in a publicly held company because their only interest at that point is in their investment. They have no other economic interests that are affected by uh, their ownership and control of that entity. And at that point, they could be treated as one. And Justice Thomas's opinion for the Court has some uh, resonance of that in it, but it specifically says it's only addressing it in terms of the per se rule.